So welcome everyone. We're very happy that you can be with us today. Um, this session, my name is Paulina. I come from Ingenio at the Polytechnic University in Valencia and I'm going to be your moderator. This session of feature transformation combines three projects, motion handbook, tools for transformative system change, science to policy training, increasing policy impact for transformation, and a model for the transformation of the learning environment of the public schools of the city of Bogota, science, technology, and innovation. So what we're going to do today is to have uh, three 10-minute presentations that will highlight and showcase uh, these transformative approaches that actually work. Each of these initiatives has uh, worked particularly work, uh, well in their approach. And then after this bit, we're going to have a space for you to, to uh, ask questions and comments about these presentations and about how they relate. To, to the transformative um, transformative innovation policy theories and concepts and practicalities. And then we will have 30 minutes for that. So to start, I would like to give the floor to Carla Albial. She will, she will introduce us to the Motion Handbook Tools for Transformative System Change. Thank you, Paulina, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, it looks, you can see my full screen, right? Okay, I guess the silence is a yes. Um, so I'll, brief, I'll briefly talk to you about the Motion Handbook, uh, which is um, it's a handbook. It's a, it's, it's a tool that we develop as part of the Motion Project, which is a collaboration between the Tipsy Consortium and uh, AIT Climate Kick. Uh, and the main goal of this handbook is to provide a guide into building what is a, what we call a transformative theory of change. Um, so first, what is transformative system change and what is the logic of this handbook and the motivation? Um, so we wanted to help, um, we wanted to respond to the question of how can private and public organizations understand how their actions contribute to transformative system change. And as you see on the figure, uh, on the right, um, normally uh, what organizations through projects uh, do is system optimization or partly system uh, redesign uh, because projects tend to perpetuate um, some of the traits of the systems. Uh, and it's hard to um, be involved in processes of system innovation where we transform um, certain systems into more sustainable um, solutions. Um, so. What we wanted to do with this handbook, it's very humbly, in a way, a contribute with a tool that can help uh, projects, programs, and other initiatives to ambition how they're contributing to the system transformation, uh, of which they're a very small part. Um, so our value proposition of this handbook is that we provide a theory-based, step-by-step, and approachable design to monitor, evaluate, uh, to design, monitor, and evaluate how projects can promote transformative change in their specific contexts. Uh, this process is co-creative and inclusive. Uh, and so the idea is that by using it, uh, you learn how to do it, you can adapt it, improve it, and share it with others. That's, that's the motto of our approach. It's guided by um, six principles, which are the principles of formative evaluation of uh, the TIPSI consortium. Um, so first, that evaluation is a continuous process uh, that should start from the design phase of a project and uh, through the implementation and the assessment at the end. Um, it's a process that actively engages stakeholders, um, as, we, as I said earlier, in a co-creation approach. Um, it applies mixed methods, um, and different approaches to data collection, to gathering evaluation or understanding the system that are um, selected and adapted given the different circumstances of the projects. Uh, it's a process that pay at, pays attention to the portfolio of uh, actions that uh, in which an initiative is embedded. And this was a very important notion for us, the idea that a project or a program is part of a, an ecosystem of actions that contribute to system change. So with the approach, we want to highlight that. And uh, it's a flexible um, theory of change approach. Um, so what is a transformative theory of change? So a theory of change is a methodology that many of you might be familiar with, uh, which is used for um, projects and program evaluation. 
Um, in this case, the transformative theory of change is an approach that uses the theory of change in, um, in addition with the MLP, uh, the multi-level perspective, which is a particular way of understanding how system change happens from the niche, so novel ideas that um, evolve and finally transform the regime, which is the existing and dominant socio-technical system. So our theory of change is particularly well suited to um, efforts that either seek to bring niche innovations into uh, the regime or to transform regimes uh, by introducing some traits of um, emerging niches. So this is an example of the theory of chain approach. Um, as you see, uh, it's basically a very similar um, approach to any theory of change with inputs, uh, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact. Um, and then, well, you see an example on the side uh, with the shared mobility. Um, there's a TO on top, which is the transformative outcomes, which I'll uh, explain in the next slide, uh, which are um, the way we conceive um, this uh, MLP into the theory of change. Uh, but what is interesting uh, of this figure is, for instance, in this case, with this to build the theory of change. So it shows you a way, a specific way of developing a theory of change. You start from the desire impact and then you work towards what outcomes are needed, what activities are needed for this specific outcomes and assess your inputs and so on. Um, so in the handbook, we offer different pathways that we call um, different approaches or, or different ways of developing a theory of change, depending on the needs of your project, whether you're working at a project program or organizational level, um, and the level of maturity of your understanding of their own theory of change. So you could either revise a theory of change and adapt it to a transformative theory of change, or you could start from scratch. So what are the transformative outcomes? Uh, and this is going to be very brief. Uh, there's a whole theory behind it that you could um, that that has been developed by the Tipsy Consortium, and so the transformative outcomes are twelve leverage points um, on this process in this process of transformation that go from uh, different aspects of building the niche and strengthening the niche to aspects of scaling and replicating the niche into uh, connecting it with other niches. Uh, and to aspects that relate to changes in the regime. So destabilizing the existing regime, promoting unlearning and deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we work with this transformative outcomes is that as you see in the as you saw in the previous figure, we overlap them with the theory of change. Um, so in the way you build first uh, your own theory of change uh, without the, the theory heavily informing it. And then you use the transformative outcomes to stretch your thinking, to structure your thinking uh, towards elements of transformation that could be found in your theory of change or could be added to your project. Um, so for example, this is the result uh, that we had of uh, one project, SUSMO, which works on shared mobility. Um, so we co-develop a theory of change with them through this uh, one year of work. This was the result of first year. And um, the theory of change, as you see, is not a linear process. It's a, a process where you have a central um, element, which is the stakeholder engagement. And then this relates to other activities, um, such as the development of private public collaborations, changes in consumer behavior, uh, policy and regulation, and so on. Um, so each of this, uh, um, each of this uh, kind of bubbles on the side is, an, is a pathway, uh, what we call a pathway. So a different way, a different element that contribute to the ultimate goal of the project. And these pathways are um, uh, an example of, of a knowledge service because they build certain um, knowledge, uh, they, they promote certain knowledge of change between experts and policy and practitioners that uh, builds up to the solution um, that the project is offering. And uh, as they work together, they, they develop, uh, they, they, they form what we call a portfolio of knowledge services. So this is kind of the, the concept that we developed throughout the handbook. And you see that there's a circle around it. Um, which is the transformative outcomes which are overlapping and connecting these different uh, elements of the portfolio. So you have circulation, replication, and so on, connecting the different elements of the for portfolio. So the, the approach doesn't end there. And we um, 
actually have some also some tools to be able to use this theory of change um, into something that you can um, use to monitor uh, your project and promote learning. So for example, this approach is a self-evaluation approach uh, where we ask the project uh, partners to assess within themselves what uh how do they, how do they think that the project is doing uh regarding certain outcome they have specified um so you have a scale on the left side uh about what what um to what extent has an outcome has been achieved and then you transform that specific uh result so say the the group says is the number three um into uh, actions that you can use uh to improve your the project outcome so you say areas of improvement what, what can we improve and what do we need and then that gets translated into a new revision of the theory of a change as i said in the beginning keep theory of change um adaptable and changing uh, as the project evolves and and then and the project partners learn um so that's it on my on my side for the motion handbook and i look forward to your questions at the end of this uh, presentations Hello everyone, I think I'll just switch to presenter mode. Um, so hi and, and welcome to, to our part of the session. Um, we're going to give you a, a very brief outline of a science to policy training that um, Lasse from Lises, uh, Michael from the Austrian Institute of Technology and myself have developed as part of the USPRI Early Career Researchers Conference in 2022. Um, and as a background, it really started with actually a conversation um, between us where we were wondering how we as early career researchers can actually better contribute to transformations. Maybe we could engage with and influence policymakers. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I actually have some experience um, from working in the US to, to support this. Um, yeah, I did some work um, with PhD STEM students uh, to training in Washington, D.C. and really a, a pretty significant demand for uh, learning to communicate um, their research, understanding the worlds uh, uh, that policymakers inhabit, uh, and, and really um, bring those two spheres together to, to communicate and, and policy for, for impact. Then the problem is that this requires some skills and competencies that are not taught to researchers and only acquired by some and after a long time. Yeah, that's really true, Lasse. But why don't we just develop a capacity building training as part of the Early Career Researchers Conference from EUSPRI ourselves to help early, careers, early career researchers like us to build those competencies? And that's what we're here to share with you, the results of our effort um, today. So we'll continue with a little bit of an outline of the, the content and key lessons learned from the exercise as well as a close with um, invitation and, uh, to collaborate and, and questions for you. So to start you off, we'll take you back to our starting point, which was the figure you can see here. So this is a uh, science to policy cycle that outlines the skills and competencies needed for creating evidence-informed policies. So this figure was created by Lena Tupp, who works at the European Commission and who was kind enough to join our panel of policy experts at the training. And as you can tell, this is a bit of a muddled landscape with uh, many different competencies that are hard to all address at once. It's impossible for any one single individual to have all these competencies. And while they might be available in some research organizations, we believe that these are best developed through networks and communities, uh, much like here at the TIPC. As you can see, we have identified that a science to policy training for early career researchers might be best positioned to address and develop two of the competencies in the cycle. And that was understanding policy and science and communicating scientific knowledge, which my colleagues will tell you more about in a second. An important uh, lesson uh, from the cycle <clears throat> is its emphasis on synthesizing research rather than production of new research. 
If publishing in high impact journals don't necessarily yield similar impacts on policies, then the focus on knowledge productions in research institutions should be complemented by a focus on synthesizing research. And of course, we believe that those competencies are best developed through training and developing early career researchers. So this autumn, wrote out a policy training within the context of the EU's free early career conference, which was co-hosted by Lysis and the Austrian Institute of Technology. It consisted of four different parts. And the first two were half-day events that took place prior to the physical conference itself, which prepared and trained the participant for the third and fourth part which featured a pitching context at the conference itself, where a panel of distinguished policy experts provided feedback for each of the pitches. So some of the key lessons from that very first part, that aspect of understanding policy, science, policy and science, that half-day training prior to the conference, just wanted to briefly share some of those lessons learned with you. We heard from the policy experts that relevance of research and addressing a particular need is really key to have impact on policy. So that could happen through connecting with policy and public discourses to really increase the relevance to policymakers to have an influence on them, to have impact on policy. You could also think about policymakers as problem owners, so that increases also the uptake, but also the collaboration with researchers. We heard that the researchers' roles and ways of working are also changing. So from the traditional sort of knowledge provision type of role, more towards becoming a process designer and a facilitator, facilitator of transformative change processes through workshops, living labs, and so on. We also heard that new skills and capacities are really, really useful. Um, aspects of these are translation skills, where you translate um, complex technical knowledge into uh, policymakers' terms or policy language or lay, layperson's terms. And we also heard that networking and relationship building are critical skills for that. And then lastly, a very interesting point was that the avenues for communication and engagement are also changing. So it's going away from sort of writing traditional reports and papers more and more towards collaborative settings, uh, for example, in living labs or other design type of workshops. Um, here I'll share a little bit of some of the content from student reflections um, as the, the communication and, and um, policy trainings themselves. So on the one hand, students were really coming away with an appreciation of how different theories of policy processes, um, whether that's the multi approach or advocacy coalition frameworks uh, or the policy cycle, um, really all have strengths and limitations. They are better viewed as heuristics uh, and chosen and operationalized depending on the circumstance of interest of the analyst. Um, next, uh, students came away really appreciating this sense that um, communication uh, really starts much earlier and it's really a function of connection actually with the policymaker interested stakeholder communities. And it's sometimes more helpful to think about it as a collaborative process rather than a one way dissemination exercise. Um, in terms of this aspect, Aspect of uh, idea of informing and influencing uh, policy processes, there was a strong emphasis and appreciation on the importance of empathy um, to, to mm. support those kinds of connections uh, with with policymakers, um, as well as the importance of self knowledge uh, around clarity of one's own purpose for for engaging in the first place. Um, finally, when it comes to communication benefits uh, benefits from the, the sessions. Um, students really came away appreciating the importance of having a very clear purpose for engaging, um, having a strong knowledge of their audience coming across in an authoritative manner, um, but also presenting ideas simply uh, and clearly and using the opportunities to practice to um, better and better presentations. So what you can see here is actually a picture of the third and the fourth part that then took place at the conference itself. Uh, the policy experts, policy panel is, is here on the very left and the early career researchers then got together in teams, developed their policy pitches and pitched to this policy panel. And after this whole um, 
well, um, elements that were part of the training. We did a survey and we had some really good reflections by the participants and some good ideas on what we can improve and build on in the future. Um, participants were saying that uh, besides understanding uh, the policy world and communication training, they would like to receive uh, training or improve their skills in terms of engagement, relationship building, networking, if you like, with policymakers. We heard from them that the relationship between what we have delivered the training and transformative innovation policy concepts or transformative change concepts could be strengthened. And we heard from them that there was uh, a need for more interaction. So quite a few ideas on what we can do in the future to improve on this training. And this is what we would actually like to do. So we would like to a find a good opportunity to take what we have developed. It's a prototype, if you like, and improve it further but also to collaborate with others who have a similar goal and here broadly formulated as improve impact of science. Um, we're looking forward to a discussion with you and we thought we flipped this around a little bit and have some <laughs> discussion questions for the audience. And um, if you have some ideas on what transformative change concepts or elements can be used uh, to improve the training, we would appreciate your thoughts. But also um, if, you, if you have some ideas on how we can develop this training for a broader audience, not just early career researchers, researchers in general, and uh, who has ideas on how to do that uh, and who we need to speak to. Um, looking forward to this discussion later. And, and with that, I want to thank you and, and end our presentation. Thanks. Good afternoon to all. Um, thank you. I am Mabel Ayure, Science Policy Leader at the Colombian Observatory of Science and Technology. The objective of this project was to propose recommendations for the transformation of the learning environments of the public schools of the city of Bogota for science, technology and innovation. It is important to say that this project is part of the general educational transformation strategy of the city of Bogota. We start with these concepts, uh, the STEM education approach, the digital transformation of education, especially the public education system, the fourth industrial revolution and the skills for the 21st century. With this, we made an extensive review of international documents and experience. Um, to understand the conditions of the public schools and learning environments of Bogota, we made a baseline of indicators for the STEM education in the public schools. We managed to collect data from 64% of the public schools with more than 5,000 responses from staff, teachers and students. Uh, at the end, I'm going to share some links so you can see the results. With the data, we were able to identify four types or learning environments in the public schools. Uh, 52 public schools in the level of in the level of approach to STEM education, 96 in the level of knowledge what is STEM education, three in the level of understanding uh, what implies the STEM education with experiences and experiments, and 52 in the level of some integration with the STEM education. With this, with this data and the analysis, uh, the document review and the very extensive multi-stakeholder conversations, we propose a definition and this model for the learning environments for science and technology in Bogota. In the definition, we consider these initial concepts, the STEM education and science education, uh, the categories from the baseline, teachers, students, pedagogical strategies, the available resources, the digital strategy, and especially the relationships with the environment. In the definition, we also consider the categories, uh, the levels, sorry, the levels of uh, learning environments in relation with the STEM education. 
for the recommendations where, for the public um, policy for science and technology education of Bogota, we propose this model. In the model, we promote that the digital knowledge program is the center of the educational transformation strategy. Uh, we propose that the transfer that Pardon, for transformation of learning environments with the digital transformation processes in the public schools. The public schools of the city have made a lot of progress around the digital field, but now the actors of the educational community have the potential to transform their own learning environments with their specific characteristics and priorities. The model and recommendations focus on three components, the STEM educational approach, the digital skills and the social appropriation of knowledge, which is a very important component in the science and technology policy of Colombia. These components include three dimensions, academic management, educational innovation and resources. The main idea is that the schools change the goal from learning science to learning with science technology and innovation in all subjects and the actors of educational community staff teachers students and families and the other actors around the public schools be the transformative actors the policy began its implementation last semester and we are waiting for the initial results of this initiative Thank you all, and I wait for your questions. That's great. Um, so I truly encourage all the all the audience to to type their questions at the chat the chat at the right side. Um, so we can start otherwise, uh, meanwhile, and we, while we get your questions, we can start with the questions that perhaps Christoph, Michael and Lasse had presented in their last slide. I think that could be a, a point uh, to start with. So we had what like what transformative change concepts can be can be used. Um, I don't know if Mabel and Carla want to comment on that or with Christoph, Lasse and, and Michael want to comment on that as well. Who wants to start? Which transformative change concepts do you think that can be used to, to, to increment or to provoke the training? Just, just as a bit of background to this question, um, we had the feeling that we did a good training for policy impact, but how do you connect it more to transformative innovation policy and transformation in general? So what sort of aspect can you feed into that training from the transformative change community that would improve the training? That's sort of the background to the question. Um, if I may, I mean, I, I'm sure you already know this, but the, I think one aspect um, is the learning uh, aspect that um, transformative innovation policy and transformations in general make a lot of emphasis. Um, I think um, if you're working with the early career researchers, they're I mean, very much um, used to the first order learning kind of approach. And then I think it's it's, it's like building the skills um, to uh, enable second order learning or organizational learning as well. And um, yeah, help them to become agents for learning would be something that could um, trigger or, or help in the process of transformation. Um, and. I don't know. I wasn't. It wasn't. Um, I wasn't sure what was the background. I mean, I, well, of course, he is free. Sorry, silly question. And but um, I think um, I remember once we did this with more like technical students, and I think the kind of providing them with the skills that uh, were more soft skills and system skills uh, from um, I don't know, not just kind of understanding the complexity of the system, but really navigating it through social relationships that was really useful for them to think transformations. Mm -hmm. 
So we have we now have a couple of questions on the public chat. Thanks, Carl. So um, for Diana says that for the three presentations, how easy or difficult do you think it is to apply transformative innovation policy? We can now Do you want to start, Carla, perhaps? Okay, <laughs> after talking head today. Um, how easy or difficult? Um, it's difficult, um, I think. Um, I think it's difficult because it's a very um, contextual concept. If you know what I mean? Like it needs to be really, um, to really operationalize it, you need to understand the organization that you're working with uh their goals their visions their setting and so it's not like you can you know easily take a hand and manual and then implement transformative innovation policy there has to be a lot of learning from both sides in the process and there has to be an opening for learning which is not there necessarily in all the organizations um having said that i think um yeah if you have um, motivated individuals that you're working with this can be done but of course it needs commitment and time Wonderful color. Maybe Mabel, do you want to follow? Yeah, it, it is quite typical actually. In in this case, for example, in the city of Bogota, the local department of education is now working with uh, an extensive group of uh, public and private organizations so we can really implement this policy and this model for the transformation of the uh, educative public system in the city. But it it's going to be a, a very long process. Hello. Um, this is basically also basically both to uh, to Mabel and Carla. How how do you end up with the the success criteria that that aren't necessarily sort of um, hard and data based but more uh, but more soft because having worked in a in a municipality's um, innovation office before uh, we found it very difficult to uh, get away with having learning as a as an outcome that was a success Michael, stuff. Is there something you want to add? Um, <clears throat> Michael, do you want to add something? I mean, uh, no, I'd be, I'd be to hear um, unless this question, and then also just to say yeah. that, as Christoph noted in our, in our presentation, that's the dimensions that we're looking to expand the depth of the program to, to really. Um, do a better job of operationalizing this transformative dimension. So we seem to have a consensus about how difficult it is. It's difficult. <laughs> it is difficult. Um, we have more questions. We have another question that said, what have been the main challenges that you have faced? If, if I can answer first, the main challenge maybe is the cultural vision of the transformation, uh, especially with the public actors. There is always fear of what implies the transformation. They maybe don't want to transform anything or, or maybe there is a little fear of the, actually the, the next questions for the getting better or for the um, policy transfer of something like that. So the cultural vision is maybe the, the main challenge. Wonderful, Mabel. Good point. Maybe Carla, do you want to go next? Um, yeah, I have, I have to agree with Mabel. Um, I think we were, um, so we work with partners that were already be very much aligned with this vision of transformation so in a way we had it very easy um i think um yeah uh in our case what was the biggest challenge 
Um, I would I would say the also from the researcher side, the having the skills or developing the skills to translate these ideas into um, concepts that are useful to the, the practitioners. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's 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 more than just making it easy. Um, it's about understanding concepts and learning to listen and things like that, and then having a different attitude towards communication, um, which is also has been a journey for us uh, in the motion project. All right. Um, so I don't know if Lasse, Michael, Christoph, who wants to go next? Um, yeah, maybe a challenge, um, not so much for us, but a challenge that we've posed actually to the participants of the training was that they had to gather in groups of three or four and develop pitches together. And they had quite diverse research backgrounds and quite diverse research projects that they were working on, yet they needed to really collaborate, come together and present one pitch. Um, and that was a huge challenge for them. But coming back to this question of what sort of transformative elements might be in this training, maybe this is one. Because um, I think transformative innovation policy is, is not just one discipline. We read this, it's transdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary, so there's a need for researchers to come together, speak to each other, understand each other, develop something together. And then there's also this need of translating that into something of, uh, you know, that's sort of accessible, because it's not just a research bubble <coughs> anymore in transformative innovation policy. So I guess the challenge that we've posed to them was perhaps an element of transformative innovation policy thinking, uh, if you like, in there. Great, Christoph, thank you. So, Michael, Lasse, is there something you want to add? So, we have another question. We can go to the next question. It's from Ed. Um, we can see it on the screen. It sounds like transformation is translated as upgrading, and this raises a question of critical perspective. So without the critical perspective, it's likely to reinforce business as usual. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah we know that. We try to avoid the upgrading or the getting better approach. Uh, we tried uh, to understand uh, and to, um, to speak with the public schools so we can't um, focus on the big concept of science and technology to propose to the public schools to um, um, not to um, find the way of learning science to get better, uh, but to learning with the science and technology available to integrate in the culture of the students and teachers and families. That's the way we, we try to, to propose the model and the recommendations for the public policy. Thank you, Mabel, that's great. So we have another another comment and question from Vicky. Um, so she, she wanted to ask whether Christoph, Lasse, and Michael could reflect on the difference between research skills and skills to become designers or facilitators of transformative processes in collaborative settings. Um, what do researchers of tomorrow actually need to learn? Practically? That's her question. Well, I think one of the things that was uh, that was mentioned by a lot of the um, the policy makers uh, and policy experts that uh, that we had as part of the training was uh, that one of the key words was empathy uh, to have the empathy with the uh, policy makers that you are collaborating uh, with and one of the one of the policy experts had an example of uh, how uh, she had once made a policy maker cry because of the complexity uh, uh, she came with when she started talking about uh, transformative innovation policy. So really understanding what situation that the policymakers are in um, and public managers are in, uh, that needs to be one of the uh, one of the skills for tomorrow. 
Thank you, Lasse. Christoph, Michael, do you want to add something? Would you say futures literacy, for example, as well? Is there something that we would like? <laughs> Our researchers of tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, it's, first of all, it's a great. It's a great question, and and the subject of futures literacy is also interesting. I'm, I work in the foresight group at um, our center and we, we grapple with that only with the future literacy of researchers, but also with the, the policymakers and practitioners that we work with. Um, I think in terms of uh, differences between the researcher sort of skills and, and these researchers or, or transformative researcher skills, I think a lot of them come down to taking sort of the, if you will, the really craft skills that you learn in a PhD about how to scope research, how to um, situate your your practice in different theoretical traditions, how to uh, select appropriate methods. It's about going um, several steps beyond that. So it's it's about situating your work in the context of other discussions that are happening or other uh, particularly policy environments. It's about being able to then synthesize um, the kind of research that you do, but also the findings from other um, other traditions, other forms of knowledge to, to, to really be able to make sense of what you're doing and help uh, the people that you work with, the stakeholders that you work with, make sense of, of what you're bringing to the table um, as a range of, of other skills associated um, with, with process design and, and facilitation. Um, and again, I would emphasize uh, some points that that Lasse and, and Christoph have made about, you know, the idea not being that necessarily um, one individual is expected to all of these skills, but rather the ability to work in teams where all of these are, are covered. And so, to add to that, uh, the ability to work to work dynam in dynamic team environments where there's different expertise and it's respected and 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 um, um, productively worked with, I think, is quite important as well. Wonderful. Um, so Mabel is going to share with us some links that might be of interest as well. Um, she, she will share the responses of the survey that they did, the teacher responses and the student responses, and also the types of learning environments. So we will, we will do that in the chat in a little while. Meanwhile, we have another comment from the public. That's from Helka. Um, I will read it out loud and we can see it now. Thanks for very interesting presentations, very interesting work concerning policy training of researchers. As said, also policymakers need competencies to operate the science policy interface. Mm -hmm. yes, of course, not only researchers, but policymakers of the future. Um, we just published a paper in research evaluation about the pre-academic competencies of practitioners to better utilize scientific knowledge in these collaborative processes. Those same things from a different perspective. It would be great to discuss about collaboration possibilities. That's what Helka said. So keep that in mind. Yes, and can we have the, uh, because I can't see any sort of contact details of who that person was. Do right. We have the... So maybe we can ask Helka to whether- And I've just, to... uh, I've just sent, I was gonna say, I've just sent Helka contact request on the tipsy Perfect. socio events uh, situation so. <laughs> so thank you helka for the interest and we would also like to see we would also like to um to read the paper so maybe it would be good if you if you paste the the title no the title um the paper's name or the title that you which um we have another question for mabel so mabel did you experience differences in the attitudes to transformation from the different educational community, from principals, managers, teachers, students, families? Yeah, um, the students, families um, are very open to transformative initiatives. Also, they are sometimes tired because there are a lot of initiatives in, the, in, in parallel so sometimes there are like well, another one no please no but they are very open the um, principals and managers the principal specials uh, the staff maybe they are 
concern about the implications, about uh, if it's a public policy, maybe it's not too long, so it's not continuity. So there are the, the impressions of them. Thank you, Mabel. So we have a comment also from Vicky saying that we've had very, very good responses from, from the presenter. So thank you for that. Um, now, Jack, Jack is, is making available the, the links that Mabel has commented before, the teacher responses, student responses, and the types of learning environment, and the social demographic characterization so that everyone in the audience will have access to them. And we still have a couple of minutes to discuss. Um, I don't know if, if our presenters want to say something about the, the other questions we've received. Or if you want to share, for example, what, what made the difference in each of the cases so that you can actually start working towards transformation. If there is something that triggered the interest or are we preaching to the choir, kind of. What did I say? Carla, what do you think? About something that triggered transformation? Sorry, what was? Yeah. Whether were we preaching to the choir? <laughs> yeah, so what, no, what, made, what made motion actually different from other projects you've worked with in terms of transformation? Uh, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, what made it different? Um, well, I think we were preaching to the choir a little bit, to be fair, in our project, <laughs> uh, because all the partners that we work with were really open to um, to our approach. And in that sense, I mean, I've had other ex other experience of co-creation where you encounter yourself in a much more difficult context, um, where there's a stakeholder conflict and issues like that, which we did not have. Um, so in a way, it was a very um, yeah smooth uh, process uh, to test and co-create our methodology. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think I, the lesson is that I really look forward to try to apply this in a, in a context where we don't have uh, the choir behind us, but rather uh, maybe a more resistant uh, organization and, and, and see whether this works the same way or not. Will should be a challenge. Um, Mabel, you wanted to say something. I saw your face. Um, I think uh, everything depends on the conversation and the fluid and constant uh, conversation with all the stakeholders. Uh, the integration of the different sectors, the academic, the public, the policy makers and the private and productive sectors all they have to be involved if we want to really um, uh, get any transformation and it's it's true that the science advice to policy makers uh, it's it's hard to achieve uh, but in this process of dialogue and permanent dialogue we can we can get some results so michael lasa christoph what do you th guys think? Are we preaching to the choir still? Or was your group a little bit mixed? So, um, I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Christoph a little bit more to the group, but in terms of the overall process that we, it's part of the, the USPRI network. Um, it's sort of a, a policy crowd and the early career conference has been sort of self-select into the process. So there is a little bit of that um i would say maybe not preaching to the choir but preaching to the curious which is actually a very helpful um thing to be able to do uh to to yeah to help people along the different path of discoveries to transformative processes um, but uh, uh, that's that's also that's for the participants then uh, for the policy experts they were really interested in um, coming along for the journey and um, were very uh, happy to uh, share their experiences and uh, 
and help um, develop the competencies of the participants. Uh, it seemed like they were holding something in that they didn't get to share too often. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Nothing to add to that. So in terms of the expansion, I didn't, I don't think we talked about that too much, right? How to like, how to, how to make this experience for a broader public, perhaps? How to make the training more extensive, right? That was one of your questions in the slides. Yeah, I mean, we have this prototype and we would like to, we think it's, it's really useful. Um, and um, we heard from the participants, they enjoyed it, and we are keen to do something with it. So we would, we were hoping that as part of the Tipsy community, we can find like-minded people um, and discuss how we can develop something together for a similar audience, for a different audience, um, uh, anything really we're, we're open to discuss. And then from, from that conversation, uh, I think a lot of great things can develop. I mean, half, half a year ago, we really started with this idea and then we developed this prototype and now we're presenting it and we're just trying to, to keep the ball rolling. And if something's out there, then please let us know. So how long is it, like the training, how? Well, we, um, we had two, uh, two half days before the conference and we were mm -hmm. always conditioned by being part of the early career uh, conference which meant that we couldn't take up too much time. So we had two uh, half-day sessions prior to the conference and then uh, a couple of hours uh, at the conference. Uh, but just to add to what uh, Christoph was saying, um, again, if you are one of the policy experts sitting out there and you are interested in this and have ideas for how, to, uh, how we can develop it further, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and if, if you'd like to sort of disseminate your experiences i think one of the the things that we learned was part of what can you know help develop this is people uh actually networking and uh, meeting these policy uh, experts uh, and people from from different practitioner uh, organizations um, so yeah don't hesitate to reach out that's, that's actually a really good point. I just want to briefly mention that again, the, the training itself became a connection device for creating relationships with policymakers. And I think that was also something that we hadn't really sort of designed for or intended, but it happened. It's quite interesting. Would it apply to different contexts like Global South as well? Or? Um, cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the I think the training is flexible in that sense that you can sort of slot in different elements, different backgrounds, different um, uh, yeah focus areas. The policy uh, context that we focused on in this training was European Union. Uh, we had someone from very experienced on that level. Then the national policy context where we had someone from uh, Austria who works at the ministry. Um, and the regional or the city context, uh, as well as someone who is very uh, versed in um, creating you know, science policy collaborations, co-design practices. So these were sort of the, the, the different sort of themes that we had, but they can be changed. Yeah, I think they can be changed. And in that sense, you could also match it to a different context. It would actually be very interesting. But the USPRI is a European uh, forum, so that, that was what we started with. And we didn't actually give and give the participants a specific problem to solve uh, in the training for the pitch, but they were sort of all connected to uh, the overall theme of the conference that was uh, transformative innovation policy. Uh, but it would be interesting also to to start somewhere completely different, like starting in a practitioner organization and finding a problem that would be interesting for um researchers with more diverse backgrounds to uh to work on developing pitches too um so i could see it developing in in, in that direction as well on top of the uh, the frame that we've got so far sounds great and challenging
we go back to the difficulties as we started, right? <laughs> so we are about to end, but it would be we have another another comment in the chat. So um, from Parawat, thank you for the presentation and the discussion. I would like to know what the title of Top et al. that is cited in one of the presentations on science policy training is. Yes, I'm just googling it here. It's called. Uh, it's so her full name is Lena Top. She works at the JRC, and the mm -hmm. title is Knowledge Management for Policy Impact: The Case of the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Wait, is that one? <laughs> yes, it's that one. Um, Lena Top, David Mayer, Laura Smiley, and Paul Kern. Knowledge Management for Policy Impact: The Case of the Europe. European Commission's Joint Research Center. Open access. Knowledge management for policy impact, the case, hold on. The case of the European Commission's Joint Research Center, the JSC. Post the title in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Lars. Yeah. I'm just, yeah, pasting it from the private, yeah. It's a really great paper. Okay, so I wonder if there's anything else that one of the speakers wants to add of what we've discussed. Last word before we leave. Michael, yeah. is there something you want to say? Uh, um, just thank for choosing our session. We know you have a lot of sessions to choose from and it's hard to spend all day on it. A digital environment so thanks for us at the end of the day here yeah exactly that thank you all carla is there something else you want to add uh thank you for joining me we're, we're still staying in um joint session um sorry i need to make a motion about this uh <laughs> Session um, 32 for the crowdsourcing of the transitions. And if you're not joining the session, check the crowdsourcing of the transitions on the wall and in the demonstrator, please, because we're running a survey and we want everybody to join. So great, Carla, thank you. Um, we now have the, the citation. Jack has, has, has posted it in the, in the public chat. So now we have the top et al right there as well for pair. Um, Mabel, last word. No, thank you all really because the digital time it's it's um, quite too much. So um, Jenny has also pasted something saying that for more information about the crowdsourcing campaign, um, we can go to the deep transitions net. Uh, .net um, slash future slash we can now see it on the screen crowdsourcing campaign so we have it right there um, perfect thank you Jenny for, for reminding us this is great as everyone knows that deep, the deep transitions and the tipsy are two very close projects that we all care about so We have one minute to go. Um, I would really like to to say uh, to thanks all the for all the presentations. So thanks to our, our presenters for this effort and for this um, magnificent response to questions and to have a lot of more discussion um, for the future. We know that these these topics are all super deep and interesting. And definitely thank you for the audience for picking us um, among the variety of options that you had. So we truly appreciate it, and we hope that this is the beginning of a of a longer conversation that we can continue throughout the days. So, thanks everyone. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to Jack who made this all possible as well.
Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.